Come. Father's love has been an amazing blessing to the Shelbyville community. I have had the privilege of growing up in Father's love and also getting to work alongside the ministry of Father's love. And I've been able to see firsthand how it's impacted this city by bringing light into the darkest places, by encouraging kids that they have a voice, that they can hear God, and that they can exercise God's will into the city themselves. And it's been amazing to see how Father's Love has empowered our own kids in the community to then go home and share God's love and His light with their families and their friends and in their schools. And it's really been raising up young leaders in the community of Shelbyville um, to then go out and change our entire city, our entire state. And, you know, we have students that have grown up and now are ministering um, in other places around the country and the world. So Father's Love really is a light to Shelbyville and to the rest of the world. My name is Stephen Riley. I'm lead pastor here at Living Waters Church. Uh, still good to be with you and with you online. I am uh, going to receive the offering in the sense of praying over offering right now. Uh, if you're here, we have uh, boxes in the back for you to uh, turn those in before you leave the building. If you're at home, we have the online services available, uh, uh, online uh, you know, function on the website where you can give online. You also can give uh, by mail. But this Father's Love transition offering called Such a Time as This that God has put together uh, in, in what's happening in the world and in our community, this is the year. This is the next few months where we transition le uh, leadership from our founder, Miss Mark, into new and coming directors, the Terrells, a new uh, broader leadership team. This is an appointed time by God. And so uh, the elders and the deacons as a board are asking you as a church family to be praying about your obedient offering to the Lord on November 8th. Uh, you can be able to give online. We have a drop-down menu that says Father's Love. So any giving from now through uh, after that week of November 8th online for Father's Love will go into this offering. Uh, please don't give to the Facebook page of Father's Love if you're from our church because that's a different fundraiser that the com they're doing with the community into, uh, uh, in into uh, the next few months. So we have, the board has three prayer goals. I'm asking you to pray with us as we pray over the offering in just a moment. Number one is a faith goal of $24,000 and then $6,000 more is the hope goal of $30,000, $6,000 more it's the love. So faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, $36,000. God is able to do that. Through you, through who he prompts, he's able to do that. Let's pray over the offering and pray and begin listening how God wants us to give on November 8th. Lord Jesus, we know that giving from your word is the way that you bless us back. We know that's a way that you, Lord Jesus, uh, help us have your generous spirit in our lives and character. And so, Lord, in our weekly tithes and offerings right now and, and what we're giving regularly, Lord God, bless it for your kingdom to expand your kingdom throughout this region and the world and Israel. And, Lord, also, as we pray toward November 8th, Lord God, Father, you know how to speak to us. You know how to guide us and provide for us. So we yield our ears to you that we can follow you and give obediently on November 8th. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've had some just rich ministry lately. Uh, and last week was that service dedicated to the Father's Love Transition message you heard from Miss Marty. Uh, a servant of the Lord that is, is um, retiring at the end of the year. She spoke, and then Gerald and Michelle Terrell spoke, 
And if you didn't hear that message, you need to get online and watch it or listen to it. It was so encouraging and exciting about our future. And I have a message today that's been actually churning for a number of weeks, and it's called True Repentance. And this image is a powerful image for me. I grew up in the country in the, near the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, and I know what cur curvy roads are like. Just a few weekends ago, uh, our family went to the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas because it was close to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I've got five Rileys who live in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And so we had a meeting place there to hang out for the weekend together. But those Ozark Mountains, I haven't spent time there before, but it, they're rocky, there's cliffs, it's up and down and all around. It's some rough roads there and curvy roads, and I enjoy driving curvy roads. It reminds me of my days growing up in Virginia out in the country on those curvy roads. But if you notice, like in that image, and if you notice, a curve is there for a good reason. That curve has to be there because if you don't take that curve, you're going to go off, and off a cliff or drop off or go into, you know, into an abyss or something. That curve is for a good reason. You can't keep going straight on that mountainside, on that hillside. It's dangerous if you keep going in the direction you're going and you need a complete turnaround. Well, true repentance is that. In this message today, it's really dedicated to us uh, as part, as American citizens, praying for true repentance in our nation. That our nation doesn't keep going the direction it's going in, but it takes a complete turnaround and goes in a new direction toward God. I have felt the heaviness of this uh, need for repentance in our nation, in the body of Christ. I have uh, been walking in this and want to continue to do this. But I want to tell you, yesterday, I got a dose of peace, of the peace of God that I can't quite explain. And I don't know if y'all are praying for me or it's just God's grace or things I've been doing before the Lord, but I did wake up with a song on my heart one of those new songs you guys were talking about. And usually I just get like a phrase or one line. I don't know the title of the song. I can't sing the whole song. It's a little frustrating. I try to you know, what is the name of that song? I want to look it up. What's it? But I just had this, this one sentence kind of going in my spirit all morning long. And I just had shalom on me all day. And I'm like, I can't, I can't just, I just can't uh, be selfish and just enjoy this all by myself. I am going to just start with the shalom blessing in the service right now. Not wait to the end and make that the conclusion. I'm just going to speak it over you and you online and your families right now. I'm going to just go ahead and say it and just ask the Lord to give you a dose right now. Are you, are you ready for that? Are you good for that? All right, that's right. Just receive from the Holy Spirit right now. Living waters, family, and friends, and those watching online, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord, His face shine upon you. And may the Lord be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His shalom. Everything as it really ought to be, nothing missing and nothing broken. May you put your full weight down and rest in the hammock of His smile. Because this smile is the smile of approval that Christ Jesus gives you by his blood. May you walk under the warmth of his presence and hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. You are blessed in order to be a blessing. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us you, the Prince of Peace, your shalom. Amen. Amen. That scripture yesterday came back to me. That in the midst of the end times parable of the tares and the wheat, where there's intensity growing because the tares are growing and, it's, and the wheat is growing and maturing at the same time, and there's this, this intensity in the end, end times and the birth pangs are increasing. But you know what? It says in Matthew 13, 43, in that parable, then the righteous will shine forth 
as the son in the kingdom of their father. And that's what I felt like. I felt like the righteousness of the son of God was just on me and it was shining his righteousness. And that's what the shalom of God does for us. Today I want to begin before I hone in on the United States of America in our true need of repentance. I want to dig first into a Bible character uh, named Daniel. And Daniel uh, was a unique Bible character. We do get a lot about his life because we see him at a young age as a teenager being captured uh, by the Babylonians and he's taken into captivity. And, um, and, and, he's, uh, and his friends at a young age, they fast and prayed and not just do the customs of the new culture. And God honors them and honors that. And, and so from a young age, we see him just being obedient to the Lord. He can hear God, and he got visions and interpreted dreams uh, for the king, and God brought him in prominence. But there's something about Daniel that they couldn't find any flaw in him in his character. And that's when the whole lion's den thing happened. They're trying, how can we get him arrested? How can we, uh, so he can get thrown in the lion's den? And, and they, they had to outlaw prayer because he, they couldn't find anything wrong with his character. Usually, when we get into the life of a Bible character, the story gets detailed enough where you do find out sins or mistakes or failures in their life. But for some reason... He was stable enough for whatever. God doesn't reveal that in Scripture. We just know he was consistently obedient to God through his whole life. And sure enough, he was in the lion's den. And, and that you know, incredible miracle where the, the lion's mouths were shut. And he lived through that. And those who set him up uh, were thrown in the lion's den. And they were actually very hungry that day. And, and took care of that very quickly. So I'm going to take you to Daniel chapter 9. And we're talking about experience that Daniel had in prayer. And we're going to learn some lessons about prayer. And I'm going to use the bigger word intercession. When you stand in the gap for someone else. You're not praying for yourself, you're interceding for someone else. And we're going to read several uh, verses in several places of uh, Daniel chapter 9. And what Daniel is seeing and finding in God's written word, he's realizing that this judgment has a time frame on it, and there is an end to this judgment, where the people of Israel have been exiled to Babylon, and there'll be a time that, he'll, that they'll be able to come back out. And he's realizing that, wow, perhaps uh, if we were a holy people, this can come to pass and God would have mercy on us. And so listen to how he prays, and we're going to read verse 5 and 6 of Daniel chapter 9 starting off. He says, we have sinned, committed iniquity, acted wickedly, wickedly, and then rebelled even turning aside from your commandments and ordinances. Moreover, we have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. Did you hear that? Did you catch what was unique about that prayer? Daniel prays like this, and what he does, he uses the pronoun we, he uses the pronoun us and our sins. In this chapter, in this long prayer, and we're not going to read it all, but it's 19 times he refers to us and we and our sins. And this is a key to intercession for others. This is a function. This is how godly people pray for others. It's called identificational Repentance, where we identify with the one who's away from God, who's lost, and we just join in with the, the humility, asking 
and for repentance and mercy. You see, when you pray for a loved one, a son who's away from God, your heart is so humble and desirous for this loved one, this granddaughter, this uh, family member, this brother or sister to get right with God. Your heart humbles and says, God, oh, please have mercy. Don't let them uh, continue in this darkness and bondage. And your heart gets in a place of humility that you cry out, and Lord, anything that I've done to contribute, please forgive me, forgive us. Lord, forgive my fathers, my forefathers. And you want to rebuke generational curses and sins that pass down. Let me tell you, we get cleansed, not just us, but our generations before us. This is one of the functions of repentance and intercession. Let's keep reading some more from Daniel, jumping down to verse 13 and 14. Verse 13 says, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come on us. Yet we have not sought the favor of the Lord our God by turning from our iniquity and giving attention to your truth. Therefore the Lord has kept the calamity in store and brought it on us. For the Lord our God is righteous with respect to all his deeds, which he has done, but we have not obeyed his voice. Now Daniel did obey his voice. Daniel was faithful in prayer. Daniel received visions, prophecies, and dreams. But he takes this repentance on and says, we have not obeyed his voice, your voice. This is the nature of where I am, I am speaking to you today, that I want to take us to where when we pray for our nation, for our community, we don't point the finger at their sins, but we humble ourselves and just say, Lord, it, this is a result of our fathers and forefathers. This is a result of the leadership of our community, of our nation. Lord God, I am part of this community. Tim Keller is a well-respected preacher in, in the evangelical body of Christ. He's um, uh, in a sc Bible scholar as well. Um, and I heard him address this recently on a, a YouTube where he was speaking at a conference. And he uh, makes just very clear that the modern Christian world is so individualistic that we just tend to, yeah, I'll repent, I'll confess my sin, sure. And we can take on the individual responsibility of our lives, and that's a good thing. But we tend to just ignore that we're part of community and that we are part, God is working, not in this individual, he's working in, in clans and communities, tribes, families. And that the Hebrew mentality that was the foundation of the New Testament, but we see it off so clearly in the old that they did think of themselves as part of a community. They did understand of the tribal mentality. You are part of a tribe. And you had leaders, and leaders could repent for the tribe. And that you, you, you did not just act on your own individuality, but you took responsibility for the clan, for the tribe, that group that you're a part of. And folks, that's something that's missing right now, and God wants it back in the body of Christ. That we do carry, we're willing to carry a burden, not because of our own life, uh, but beyond that in our community, in our region, in our nation. It's a form of intercession where we stand in the gap for someone else. So, can you hear yourself praying like this, like Daniel? Do you do it now? Could you, could you do it? And, and in the Old Testament, again, we hear that, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and it lists the generations, and it's, that's the mentality. It's repeated over and over again to say, you're part of this. And so Daniel is repenting not just for his generation, but the sins before him and the the decisions the leaders made before him. It's the way, the mindset that God set in biblical culture. So let's read another 
one of his prayers. Uh, verses 18 and 19 of Daniel chapter 9. He says, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we are not presenting our supplications before you on account of any merits of our own, but on account of your great compassion. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and take action for your own sake. O oh my God, do not delay because your city and your people are called by your name. So he knew that even though that he had a blameless life, he doesn't, he doesn't come to God on account of any merits of our own, any righteousness, good deeds, any good actions. No, instead, he says, uh, we are here because you have great compassion. And you want us to come to you and repent and confess the sins of our forefathers and of our colleagues and our family members. Can you imagine yourself this week praying like this, using these hours we pronouns this week in your prayers? There's a verse I've referred to before. I'm going to ask you to go there. Hebrews chapter 12 starting in verse 26. I believe it's a, a good scripture of where we are in the world. That we are in a world that is shaken. That this pandemic is beyond our borders of America. And that God has a purpose and a reason and He has, he has a hopes out of the shakings that are happening. And I'm just going to read this out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26 through 29. It said, And his voice, God's voice, shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken, as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we, we may offer to God an acceptable sacrifice, acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. So you know, fire purifies. And when it consumes metals, it gets the, the impurities, the things that are not clean and good, it purifies them out of the metal. That's what this is. That is what God's shaking does. It's to purify us so that we can offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. God wants to build in us during in this year of 2020 shakings reverence and awe of God. I felt that this morning as Julia was leading worship. That despite circumstances and despite the obstacles of going up the mountain, there is a song to sing. There is worship, a grace to worship and, and be in awe of God despite all the distractions around. Because God wants to shake those things that are created, have been created, things that we have built up. He wants us to remove those things that are not Him, that are not solid, built on the foundation. That's the purpose of shaking. See, God is trying to get our attention. And I believe our means mine. I believe our means living waters. I believe our means Kentucky, the United States. I believe it's the world, both the body of Christ and the world. I believe shakings begin with the body of Christ. And it's our response to God that inspires the, 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 those in the world to see, wow, look at this. They're not driven by fear. They don't live in fear. They have a peace. They have, what's this shalom thing you talk about? What is this reverence and all that you have in the midst of all of these disruptions? And they see us and they go, I want that. This, this shaking got my attention. Look at how you, the body of Christ, are responding. I want that. 
let's step back and just remind ourselves, what is a true definition of repentance? Well, it is a change of mind that leads to a change of heart, that leads to a change in actions. This change in, involves both a turning from sin and a turning to God. It is more than just our, the way of thinking, it, but it includes our minds, so we make the choice. It ends up getting deeper and getting in our heart. It's a change of heart, and it leads into change of actions, so it's something that can be seen over time. It's a turning away from darkness and turning toward God. And thank the Lord for that scripture. He uses anything to get our attention. He uses shakings. He uses the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And as the Bible said, that his kindness leads us to repentance. And I feel like we've got to realize it is God's loving kindness. It is his great compassion that anything that he does is he's motivated. That's what he's motivated by. Jonathan Cohn has uh, really arisen as an author in the last uh, number of years with Harbinger 1, now Harbinger 2 books and other books he's written. He um, led on, um, in Washington, D.C. on September 26 called The Return, A Day of Repentance, and I spent a lot of hours that day, uh, a part of that um, online uh, that day of repentance. But I like his quote. He says, Shakings can bring repentance, and repentance can bring revival. But you can't have revival without repentance. But shakings can bring repentance, and repentance can bring revival. I want to mention now more specifically about the United States of America and that there is a season for the body of Christ to lead the way in the repentance. There is a season of repentance for the United States and I believe it's now more than ever. I believe the United States has a unique place in the earth. It's not the same as Israel. God started Israel with one man, one family, Abraham. He blessed that nation uh, when there was just one man and one family. And that's a blessing of eternity. But there were believers who came to the United States of America in the 1600s and the 1700s. And when they came, they were godly people looking for religious freedom. One of those founding fathers was John Winthrop. John Winthrop came in 1630. Puritans, they were, uh, went into the, what's called the Massachusetts Bay today. And he proclaimed that this land would be a city uh, on a hill lit in a city shining for the earth. He proclaimed that the the blessings of God that were on Israel will come to this nation. And he also claimed that if we disobeyed God in his ways, we would receive the judgments that, that Israel received as well. Another founding father is George Washington. In 1789, he was, his inauguration was right there at where Ground Zero is today in Manhattan. And in his inauguration speech, he said in eloquent words, and so I'm not going to rewrite it and reread it, but if you read it and you understand the eloquent words, he's saying, from heaven they can come the blessings of God, but if we turn away from God's ways, then heaven can't bestow those blessings. He and the congressman walked to the church next door, St. Paul's, that's still standing today, protected by, uh, no, I'm sorry, I might get in the church mixed up on the, which of the churches are. But anyway, the church, you know, it was St. Paul's, is still standing today, but that church, in that church, after the inauguration, George Washington and the Congress went in there and knelt and dedicated the country in, in prayer to God. 
So what does the term harbinger mean? It's a word I don't use every day. It means it's a, a sign of warning, of something coming down the road, the precursor, a forerunner, a herald, a foretelling. And Jonathan Kahn says there are signs that have happened, particularly focused around September 11, 2001, 9-11, that are signs from God to warn us. I'd like to mention a few of those uh, today, a couple of those today. One is from Isaiah chapter 9. verse 8 and 11 through 11. It's not on your screen, so you'll have to go ahead and pull out your Bibles this time and your, or your phone, where your app is. I have a couple scriptures like that. This verse, let's just read it first. I'll tell you how it gets tied in to current day America. But verse 8, the Lord sends a message against Jacob, and and it falls on Israel. And all the people know it. That is, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, asserting in pride and in arrogance of heart. The bricks have fallen down, but but we will rebuild with smooth stones. The sycamores have been cut down, but we will replace them with cedar. Therefore, the Lord raises against them adversaries from resin and spurs their enemies on. This verse is a verse saying how Israel responds to calamity or judgment, and they respond in pride and arrogance and say, we will rebuild. And we will uh, build with smooth stones and we'll... Where the sycamore has fallen, we'll put in cedar trees. Well, this verse verse was quoted by a congressional leader on September 12, 2001, out of our Capitol building in Washington, D.C. Proclaiming, and maybe he didn't realize it, but this, out of a spirit of arrogance and pride, we can rebuild without God. We can do it ourselves. At ground zero, there's a tree that was destroyed. They have the roots of that tree displayed. And in that place of that tree was planted a very large tree of hope, was the name of it. It was a cedar tree. It started dying. They didn't know why. They would prune it. They would, try to, they would try to nurture it. And it took about, I think, 11 years. But this tree just kept dying, and they just got rid of it. And there's no tree there today. Another little, could this be coincidence, or could this be God giving us a warning? How many of you have heard of the one-year Bible that came out in the 80s? The one-year Bible is just a reading plan of Old Testament scriptures, Psalms and Proverbs and New Testament scriptures that you read each day, and they spell them out for you so you work through the whole Bible in a year. But you read a little bit from the Old and from the poetic literature in New Testament. And back in the 80s, this became popular. You can look it up today, and you can read it on, you know, just get the reading plan. You don't have to buy the book. You can just get it online. Well, on September 11th includes Isaiah chapter 9. Coincidence or not, folks, I'm just telling you, we're seeing repeated signs that God could be saying September 11th was a, God is using that to be a forewarning to America Please repent. Have true repentance. You see, I'm struggled 
with the question, more than one question, but a couple questions in the last six months, in the last few weeks, in the last, just during this whole time of the pandemic, our civil unrest, is God, could these be judgments from heaven? Could these be judgments from heaven? And I have struggled with that, and I, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to raise it up. I didn't want to I'd get in conversations with friends and individuals to, to help me dialogue and dig, or, dig deeper. And I'm just being honest. It's a hard question to ask. I want to say this about God's judgments. If there is God judging something, His Spirit is at work, coming out a, of a compassionate heart, where his goal is that none perish, but all come to the knowledge and the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That when he does judge a nation, that he is actually granting mercy to shake us, to get our attention. You need true repentance. If you recall back in 9 11, 2001, there was a flood of people going back to church. There was a lot of good that happened for a number of weeks and months. But the nation as a whole seemed to get back into routine as usual, and the morality and the sins and the, and of, our, of our culture just got deeper and deeper and farther away from God in these last 19 years. I've asked another question, and it's, it's a hard one to grasp. I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to say it because you probably think it like I do. Think about this like I do, and I, I don't claim to know clear answers. But I am trusting in the character of God that he is great in compassion, and whatever he's doing, he's redeeming it and working it for, to bring our good in our lives. But could judgments of 2020 could these be judgments of 2020 and can christian people suffer because of god's judgments and i want to say no i want to say no god wouldn't do that that wouldn't happen he would work it out in a way and and it did happen in in egypt when when the passover angel came and that that judgment of the angel and the firstborn died and they put the blood over the doors, the blood of the Lamb, and they were completely protected from those plagues in Egypt. And they were fully delivered out of that bondage. But there are other judgments. In the Hebrew Scriptures, where they were on a nation, they were an enemy, God used enemy armies to come and, 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 and rout Israel because of judgments, and good, obedient people suffered. So I can't find it one way or the other. I can't get to a, proof, a text and quote it and say, I know this, this is the answer for sure. I can't go there. I can't find that scripture. talking about the pandemic. Right now, this question was just looming in my face when a close friend of mine and pastor in Henry County was in the ICU for over a week and, and had a brush with death because of COVID-19. A member of this church, his sister in Louisville, has a mother-in-law that in those early months here in America, she was in her 80s and she she wasn't very healthy, and she ended up dying because of COVID-19 complications. And she was a believing woman, a church member for years, godly praying woman. I have a Christian friend who's a doctor in the Lexington area, and he said, I have a colleague who is a Christian and serving us, got COVID-19 and passed away. We know people in our area of friends of ours and their relatives or, or friends that have suffered greatly 
uh, because of the, the, the complications or even passed away. And they were believers. God, I don't like that. I don't like how this is fitting together. It's hard for me to put it together. Lord, please awaken us. Let these shakings be effective. Let us not be like 9-11 and we just drift back into our old ways and get distracted. Remove the things that are created that keep us from the awe of, and the awesomeness of God. I believe in the character of God. I believe in all suffering that God has a way to bring redemption to bring a depth in us. I believe that in every death of a believer, where it's a young person or an older person, COVID-19 or a car wreck, that God has this way of bringing a death is the ultimate victory for us. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 15, when he describes the resurrection, that is his victory statement over death, that all of us, when we die, no matter what the reason, we experience Oh, death is swallowed up in victory by the resurrection power of God. And we experience the eternal home that we've always longed for and we've always wanted. If you would allow me, let me just mention another potential harbinger here. It's a, just a, a little note in a scripture, but it does bring us in a place of attention. Lord, are you, are you pointing to this season in America in 2020? But in uh, 2 Kings 25, it says at verse 8, Now on the seventh day of the fifth month, which was the ninth year, of King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar sends his captain of his armies to Jerusalem for the final blow to destroy the walls in the city of Jerusalem and bring the exiles out of Judah, the southern kingdom, and to Babylon. So this is where, in Scripture, Babylon destroys Jerusalem. And Jonathan Kahn says that this 19 year is significant. And if you look it up earlier in chapter 24, in when Nebuchadnezzar first comes to Israel, he puts in subjection the king of Israel. And that king and subsequent queen, kings continue to do evil. And Nebuchadnezzar sends these waves of attacks to Israel until in the 19th year is the final attack to totally exile the Jews out of Jerusalem and take control and destroy the city of Jerusalem, only leaving people to take care of the land And he says, folks, we're at the 19th year. September 11, 2001 was a harbinger. It was a warning sign. And here we are in the 19th year. This is a season of repentance for the body of Christ and hopefully for the world. You see, God takes note and remembers things that we might forget about. What's happened over these 19 years when 2015, our Supreme Court legalizes same-sex marriage. And if you have felt it like I have felt it since 2015, that, that incredible day, that incredible week, I, I felt just the, the release that our government was holding back uh, this perversion and now we see even on children where children are being encouraged uh, all the way down to to transgender at eight years old or whatever parents do today it is just it is heartbreaking to see this release 
of perversion out since 2015. Now there's many reasons as you look in Scripture, but a couple that I want to mention why this grieves the heart of God. One is because children suffer so much because of this sinful way of our nation to accept. Children need a husband, a, a mother and father, a marriage to see God clearly. And that's why when Genesis, when he said, I, God created man in our image, in the image of God, he created them both male and female. And that marriage and that parenting is what, how children see the character and nature of God. But it's an affront to God himself. Because God created marriage, male and female, and it's been that way for all civilizations to understand what marriage is. This marriage is what he identifies, his love for his people. And in the Old Testament, he calls himself the husband of, of God's people, the, the bride. And in the New Testament, Jesus calls himself, I am the bridegroom and my body of Christ, my my." children who've been saved they are my bride and so it's an affront on his romantic love that he set up before us to see physically to remind us of his love for us and yet when i say how this breaks the heart of god so much he loves a homosexual a lesbian just as much as you or anyone else or me That uh, breaking of the sin does not break his heart for the love and the greatness of compassion for that individual. The same true for those who are very close or understand abortion in their life. God remembers and knows what's going on with abortion in America and the world. He doesn't forget about that. But I have to, in the same sentence, say, and God didn't forget about the hurt and pain of a woman or a man that has participated in an aborted an abortion and their heart aches and there's a wound there. God is pursuing you with the greatness of his love to bring you healing and restoration. In 1970, New York City, excuse me, in 1970, New York, the state of New York, passed abortion on demand. Three years later, in 1973, was Roe versus Wade. That was abortions allowed up through 24 weeks. God doesn't forget about that. And he doesn't forget that in just 2019, New York, the same state, uh, uh, passed and approved abortions up through the birth of the child for certain mental or health reasons of the child, of of the mom. We're at around 62 million babies that have been aborted. God in the scriptures over and over again judged nations and Israel was one of them that had child sacrifice and innocent blood was shed on their nation. And you can argue and I wouldn't you know, fight you on this but child sacrifice and abortion is not exactly the same thing but the trend of states wanting to go to the 40th weeks is as close as you can get folks. An infant can be born at around 24 weeks and live. How can anybody with a common sense or logical mind or anyone in the medical field can say, yes, I support abortion into these late stages? There's no common sense to it. They know how early their heartbeat is. They know, and yet this is, this is you, you have to sear your conscience to go there. Is this an open door of mercy that God is granting us? Because realize that on September 11th, 
2001, on, off the island of Winthrop. John Winthrop owned an island, and the Boston airport is on that island. That that's where those planes and those pilots left on September 11th before that great and horrible day. And that was the place that was declared, we will receive the blessings of Israel. Hallelujah. But if we disobey God, we will receive the judgments like Israel. Could this season of where there is an opportunity as we speak for a pro-life judge to get on the Supreme Court, could this be a way if we cry out for mercy and repent, that God could actually change the direction of this great sin that deserves great wrath on our nation and the world. Lord God, have mercy. This is, this is incredible, the timing of what's happening. Now, if you know more than I do about how all this works out in, in the judicial branch and the legislative branch, but... I understand it, that even though um, uh, Judge Amy Barrett may get uh, on the Supreme Court very soon, it's not like the next day they take a vote in reverse Roe versus Wade. But a court case has to get to the Supreme Court that would deal with that issue, and how many months or years will that take? And then what the likelihood is, is that it would revert back like it was is a choice of the states. And right now, roughly, if you look at it, about half of our states would get more protections and would pass laws to be more rigid about abortion and protect the unborn child. But about half would go the other directions, like New York. And so even after that gets released from the Supreme Court, there's still great battles ahead. What is that going to look like in our country? Lord God, have mercy. I want to take us to a scripture you've heard all these six months many times. I want us to go to it again to give us a guide on how to close in prayer. It's 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Verse 13 and 14. It says, if I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, before I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. You see, that verse 13, we sometimes skip because the meat of it is in 14, right? But look at the context. It says, verse 13, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> if I shut up the heavens so that there's no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people. There is in Africa, if you read websites on the current certain places in Africa, the hunger is really bad because of famine, because of lack of rain. Have you also read of the locust swarms in Africa this year? It's not just an ancient phenomenon. That can happen even in today's world. And the great swarms, the unexplainable um, swarms in other parts of Africa. But a pestilence, that's another word for a plague of, from disease. Where people die from disease. So we know we have at least one of these three, maybe more than one of these three. That when this is going on, when the plague is happening... That is when we pray. That's when we repent. That's when we call out and ask forgiveness for our ancestors and our forefathers, all those who have gone before us. That's when we, we humble ourselves and we don't point the finger and say, your sins and your sins and I can't believe this and that. 
No, be humble and repent like Daniel. Pray like Daniel. Intercede like Daniel. Can we take some moments right now? If Julia and the praise team could come back up and, and just bring us in a place of seeking God. So what I'm hoping you're going to do is that you're going to take this teaching and keep with it for a number of days. Uh, in fact, next Sunday, I'm going to teach on repentance again, more out of a New Testament setting, more out of the blood of Jesus context. And we're going to do something we haven't done here in a long time. We're going to actually take communion together. And I tell you that a week in advance, so those at home... If you want to get some grape juice, great. Any juice, coffee will work fine, whatever. But uh, just to prepare you, if you want at home uh, to, to go in that direction. But we've, we've purchased a new style of, of juice and, and, and cracker. They're individually wrapped in one container. One side is the juice, and then the other side is the cracker. So we don't have to pass those around and get your hands all into that. So we'll have that in a... And demonstrate uh, distributed in a safe way, and um, and so we're going to during a prayer time next Sunday receive communion. But let's take this passage right here. Let's follow it because we are have these signs before us. So thank you, Lord, that we are people who are called by your name. That we have, Lord Jesus, in us. We're marked by the name of Jesus Christ. And we have your name. We humble ourselves. And that's something that sometimes we struggle with. I really don't feel like repenting. I really am not convicted about anything. Well, listen. Humble yourselves for the sake of others, for the sake of our nation, for the sake of our community. Humble you initiate it. Don't wait. Well, I don't really feel convicted. I really can't get into this right now. I feel like I'm okay. This is an intercession for others. You choose and you humble yourself to step into this. Lord, we are called by your name. We humble ourselves right now. And we pray and we seek your face. Lord, your face of, that's great with compassion, your face that's broken with brokenness on the sin of your people and of America, your face that has the one desire that all would be saved. You didn't die on the cross for nothing. You didn't die on the cross and suffer that so that just any old person would go to hell. No, God, you've made the way a great and painful way through the cross. And so we seek your face, Jesus. And we turn from our wicked ways. Lord, the ways and my motiv motivations that are selfish and focused on myself. Lord, in ways and, and, and bad habits that just serve me and me only. Lord, God, the ways of my thoughts of pursuing impurities, lust and perversions, and selfishness, Lord God. Father, my actions and the ways that we do things, Lord, I'm praying for myself. I'm praying for those around me. I'm praying for our nation. It's our sins, Lord God. Lord, forgive us. Lord, there's children that are being abused. There's there's verbal and physical abuse for God all in our nation there's prostitution and child trafficking around our nation Lord God there's pornography Lord among our people Lord God in the church and outside the church Lord there's greed for money that that's the only motivation is greed for money fueling decisions in business and politics Oh, God, have mercy on us. 
Lord God, there's greed for power, Lord, in position in our in, in the companies that we work in and the organizations that we're in. And there's there's abuse of of control, Lord Jesus, for self. Just have mercy on us, Lord God. May we be people of justice, people of humility, Lord God. Lord, there's so much selfishness, Lord God, that children and marriages are put on the back burner, Lord God. And Father, we're, there's brokenness in marriages and families and children are suffering, Lord God. Have mercy on our children that are suffering. Have mercy on us as a nation. Bring us back to you for your sake, for the children's sake, Lord God. Lord, this possible appointment of Judge Amy Barrett into the Supreme Court and, and future Supreme Court appointees, Lord God, Father, we're asking that you use our judicial system, our, our, uh, a, our legislative systems, Lord, our executive branch, all of it to protect the unborn, Lord God, bring us away in our nation that we don't continue with the thousands and millions being uh, the innocent blood being shed all over our country, Lord God, bring ways, bring righteous leaders, Lord God, that would protect the unborn, Lord God. Have mercy on us. Don't let us stay in this path, Lord God. Turn it around, Lord God. Our hearts want a turnaround from this shedding of innocent blood, Lord Jesus. We know we deserve judgment because of it and other sins, Lord God. We deserve judgment. So that's why we call out to the God of mercy, the holy God, that all of his work brings a righteousness and, Lord, redemptive goodness to his people. Lord Jesus, we call out to you because, Lord, suffering is tough and hard and we need help and we need you to redeem our sufferings, Lord Jesus, that we can look to you in all things that are disruptive and are, are, are painful and are difficult, Lord God. Father, we want to be a people that is struck with awe of your awesomeness and in reverence and Lord God and not be consumed with fear. We don't want to be a body of Christ, the bride of this glorious, glorious groom Jesus that loves us so much. We want to stand tall with you. We want to be at your side and with courage, Lord God. We want to be full of obedience, Lord. A bride that's so in love with you that the answer is always yes and amen I follow you Lord God we want our romantic love for you to be so real and powerful that the disruptions of our world and community cannot keep way keep us from prayer keep us from worship and our hearts yearning for you Lord God we want to be a first commandment people that we love the Lord God with all of our hearts mind soul and strength and we continue to obey you in the second now that the second is like it, that we love our neighbor as yourself, as ourselves. Lord Jesus, Lord God, purify me, purify living waters. Lord, may your consuming fire purify us, Lord God. We know consuming fire is not always fun, Lord God, but we want to get rid of that impurities and that dross, Lord God. We want to be a shining metal before you, Lord. Father, we ask, Lord God, that this cleansing in the body of Christ that living water spills over to others, Lord God, and people will humble themselves before you and repent. Lord, we believe the body of Christ, Lord God, we pray we don't, we, we stop pointing fingers and we, Lord, put our attention on humility, crying out to a compassionate, merciful God. Oh, Lord Jesus. Oh, Lord Father. Lord, we thank you that Humility, worship, repentance is effective and part of spiritual warfare. And so, Lord, as we do take our stand in the evil day against dark forces and our great battles in the heavenlies, Lord God, we pray that we or remain soldiers in your army that are humble, that we remember who we serve, that we serve a compassionate God. Lord God, thank you for purifying us. Thank you, Lord, that your word is enough. 
I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in worship, but I'm going to go ahead and give you a blessing into the week. Oh, Lord Jesus, as we wait on you, that you, we ask that you do help us humble ourselves and fulfill this scripture of prayer in 2 Chronicles 7. And Lord, we also pray that your grace would be more than, more than enough. That we would shine like the sun with the righteousness of your son. And that your shalom is over our spirit, soul, and body this week. And Lord God, with that, Lord God, others would be blessed. So good to be together. Have a great week. See you again soon.